Okay. For our uh, last talk of the day here, we have uh, Howie Major, who will be talking about type of gene ethics that diverge on average in modulus. So thanks, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, uh, happy, very happy to be here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, joint work with uh, Paula Pisa and about, as the title indicated, it has to do with type molar geometry um, on moduli space. Um, but let me um, make a, first a couple of sort of general definitions. Um, so X is going to be uh, a non-compact um, topological space. <laughs> okay. um, and phi sub t would be a flow. So this notion is coming from dynamics. Phi sub t from x to x for, as a flow. And a first kind of general definition is that you say that phi sub t, so you say that phi sub t diverges at x um, if, if you take any compact set K, um, eventually for large enough T, phi sub T of X uh, doesn't, is outside of K for T large enough. T large. For all T large enough. Okay, so eventually it leaves every compact set. Um, a little more, you know, slightly less common is this notion, which is in the title, about divergences on average. <coughs> and in the literature, uh, sometimes this is called lo loss of mass, um, for maybe a reason we we'll can see in a minute. Divergences on average, uh, so phi sub t divergences on average at x, um, if, well, for any compact set, you look at the amount of time that you spend in K. You might come back to K many times. Um, so if you look at the amount of time, <coughs> say from, if you go up to time capital T, the amount of time between a little, between zero and capital T, that phi sub T of X is in K, divided by T, <coughs> the total amount of time, that this goes to zero. Um, as t goes to infinity um, for every k. Um, so it could come back to k, but the amount of time you spend uh, uh, divided by the total amount of time goes to zero. So that's the diverging on average. OK, um, what I want to do is talk about um, very classical, what these notions are in the very classical case of the type molar space of the torus. So the type molar space of the torus. So well, actually, um, we're interested in geodesics, so really I need the tangent space. Um, so that's this familiar SL2R module SL2Z. So with a familiar picture, there's the fundamental domain. Maybe we take the point I, which I think is here. And now we're looking at all geodesics. So let me re 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 erase the fundamental domain. We take a point, any point, let's say I, and we look at all the geodesics, the hyperbolic. So the, the, the type of metric is the hyperbolic metric. And so we're looking at all of the um, geodesics. Um, so this is the point X. <coughs> we're looking at all the geodesics emanating from X from I, and they all go to a point on the real line, say Y, and it's a uh, kind of classical deal that one understands the behavior of the geodesic in this moduli space, um, the moduli space. So this is, of course, not uh, the torus, but a moduli space, the modular curve. <coughs> Um, we understand the behavior of the geodesic in the moduli space according to its continued fraction expansion. So if you write a zero, then y is in its continued fraction expansion. Okay? 
then the behavior of the geodesic in the quotient is determined by the behavior of these a sub i's. Now, when do you diverge? Well, that's pretty simple. Here's the fundamental domain. You'll mess around for a while. And diverge means eventually, when you back into the fundamental domain, you have to go to infinity. And that happens exactly when y is rational. So you diverge if and only if y rational. And from my point of view here, or from a certain point of view, I'm interested in measuring how big is this set of x's where you diverge. And this is countable. It's rational, so it's really a small set. Uh, now diverge on average. Um, well, now there's something one can actually, there's something to say here. So you come back to a compact set, and then you maybe leave, and leave go out near the cusp, and come back, and so forth. And how deep you go in the cusp is <coughs> determined by these a sub i's. When a sub i is big, you spend more time in the cusp. And here is the condition. So this was actually just recently written down by Chud, um, Chudhuri. Um, let me explain why it works. You diverge on average if and only if the geometric mean, so you take the product of the a sub i's, equals 1 to n, and uh, take the nth root. This goes to infinity. Um, and another way of writing this, which is maybe more transparent, is if I take logs sum of the logs, the average of the of the, the log, the sum of the logs goes to infinity. Okay, let me just try to indicate what the point of that why why this is true. Okay? Um, so what this number you if along your geodesic you're moving in the moduli space of a torus, so you have moderate length curves along the way. They're given by the uh, partial quotients of this continued fraction, pi over qi. And what this number ai is, is the amount of Dean twisting you do to go from the i minus first partial quotient to the i. So ai measures twisting. in going from one curve to another, going from the uh, i minus first, I believe, to the to the i curve. I plus, plus. Maybe it's i to i plus one. Okay, and here's our picture. Here's the upper half plane. Here's the line. Oops, one equal one, different line. Okay, and so if you twist ai times, you're going from you're adding ai um, ai times. The, the hyperbolic geodesic, of course, looks like that. The length of the hyperbolic geodesic, if this is, say, um, i and this is i plus ai, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, i to <coughs> um, i to a plus i plus h a, the length of that curve is roughly log of h a, the length of the geodesic. And that's roughly how much time you're spending in the cusp. Now, of course, that depends on your definition of what the cusp is. If, but it's, if I'm above some horizontal line, then this is the amount of <coughs> time that you spend outside the cusp. I may have to add or subtract, uh, subtract some function of, of, of the, how, how thin the cusp is. But roughly speaking, this is the amount of time in the cusp. So then you're summing up the amount of time in the cusp, and then you're dividing by the total time, and that's going to infinity. Okay, so that's diverging on average. So diverging is uh, kind of a trivial thing in the modular curve, but diverging on average is some real, some real condition. And actually, here's the another. Um, so there are a lot of results about. You have some real number. You look at some condition on their continued fraction. And, um, and you want, now want to measure the uh, Hausdorff dimension or 
even Lebesgue measure of the set of real numbers that satisfy your condition. And in this case, so I'm going to call it diverging on average, the Hausdorff dimension is exactly a half. Um, and there's a list of names here. I just, this paper is not that old. Um, yes? So is n the dimension, are you comparing the time in the cusp versus the time in the thick part? I hope I'm, um, this is, so if you look at this the is the cusp. This is measuring how much time you spend in the cusp. And um, n is the number of times. So I, did, I get, I, did I mix up zero and infinity? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, this is just based on numbers, right? This so the end is the yeah, one this is, the, 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 you, are, you are diverging on average if and only if this happens. Okay. Yeah. So n, n is the number. N is the index. Uh, the oh, yeah, okay. This is the, the index here. So the number of coefficients. Yeah, yeah. that's the time in the thick part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is the number of coefficients. Number of coefficients. Yeah. Um, okay, there's a series of authors here. Um, Wu, okay, one more, which is that the, um, that the, the, that the Hausdorff dimension is a half. Okay. Um, now let me move on to higher genus, but finite genus. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let me, um, well, type space of genus G. So this is the set of, I'm, and I'm not going to use hyperbolic geometry, but complex analysis, the set of Riemann surfaces of genus G. Um, modulo um, equivalence, which is conformal maps. So you have an underlying topological surface. These X is the set of Riemann surfaces on the topological surface S. Um, uh, up to equivalence, which is conformal or biholomorphic and isotopic to the identity. Isotopic to the identity. Okay. So that's a type of space from the complex analytic point of view. Um, what's a quadratic differential? So here's kind of an old-fashioned definition. Well, um, there are charts, uh, so a quadratic differential, Q on X, is there's a covering, there's a finite number of singular points, which I'll ignore, uh, but you have a covering of X minus some singular points by charts, say, and so that in the overlapping chart, in the overlap, um, say you have two charts, Z and Zeta, in the overlap, Z is plus or minus Zeta plus a constant. Um, the more familiar kind of way people think about, well, quadratic differentials or abelian differentials these days is to think of what you have is, well, what people call a translation surface. So this would be an abelian differential, which is a special case, um, where an abelian differential, you have a polygon or polygons in the plane with opposite sides, not opposite sides, um, sides identified in pairs by translations. So these are also called translation surfaces. And the fourth, okay, so that will give you a surface of genus G. Um, abelian, quadratic differentials, you allow identifications not just by translations but by uh, 180 degree reflections in the origin and translations. Okay, um, so a quadratic differential uh, on X defines a, a Teichmuller geodesic. So Q, so this is Teichmuller's theorem, time defines a geodesic. And what you do to define the geodesic <coughs> is you take the horizontal lines, which are well defined by this relations, this, uh, uh, you, and you expand along the horizontal and contract along the vertical. So, so familiar to most people, but anyway. 
by expanding along horizontal lines by e to the t and contracting along the vertical by, uh, by e, the same amount, contracting by e to the t. So expanding in the horizontal and contracting along the vertical. So that defines a type molar geodesic, which I'm going to call g sub t or maybe t sub t of g. So it's really a whoop of q. So this is the geodesic. OK? And I'm interested in now what happens in moduli space. So in type molar space, the uh, modulo of the mapping class group. So this is moduli space. And I'm interested in the behavior. OK. So in particular, this issue of divergence and divergence on average. So divergence is already more complicated. In the case of the genus 1, the only thing you can do is mess around for a bit and then go to infinity. In higher genus, you have the following kind of schematic possibility. Maybe a curve like that gets short, <coughs> alpha, and then a curve like that gets short, and they're both simultaneously short, so you're near the cusp. And then while beta is short, alpha sort of gets moderate or even long, and maybe a new curve gamma, which crosses alpha, gets short, so now you have two curves that are short, beta and gamma. And then you wait till beta gets moderate length, while gamma is still short. And then a curve that's maybe like that, omega, which is disjoint from gamma, gets short, and so forth and so on. So you can diverge with by a succession of curves, one after the other getting short, but no curve staying short forever. Um, as in would have to be in the case of the torus. So this divergence set, in fact, um, it's hard to decide in some sense, looking at the quadratic differential, what it, how do you decide whether the corresponding geodesic diverges? It's kind of not so clear, actually. Um, but I want to look at what's called a type molar disk. So diverging on average, what would that mean? Well, it mean you'd have a succession of short curves, but you could return to the thick part every once in a while. Don't spend too much time there. It's not so interesting. Go back into the cusp. Spend much more time in the cusp. Come back and, and so forth. So um, now what I want to do is set up two sets here. Um, so let me, yeah. How do I want to write this notation? Yeah, so I want to look for each for each theta between 0 and 2 pi, I want to look at, you can rotate your quadratic differential by theta. So that just simply means you keep the same Riemann surface, but you, well, in this picture, you just rotate the polygon by some angle. And you get a new collection of horizontal and vertical lines because you've rotated. And so r theta of q will be a new quadratic differential on the same Riemann surface. And I'm interested in whether the geodesic determined by this diverges, diverges on average, and so forth. So let me set up the notation. Uh, div q equals the set of theta such that r theta of q, so this quadratic differential, diverges, de de determines a divergent geodesic, diverges. And then let me write just div. A average of q is the set of theta such that the, I should say the geodesic of diverges and diverges on average. Okay, and now let me uh, write down a theorem. So, as I was saying, this could be complicated. Um, 
let me just, for the experts in some sense, for the, if Q is a Veach surface, determines a Veach surface, um, that's like the torus, then this set is countable because the only way you can diverge is um, by pinching a simple closed curve. You don't have this crazy behavior of a succession of curves. So for Veach surfaces, this is countable. Um, and there are other examples where it's countable, but it's typically big. And let me, so, but I, I sort of don't know the answer to what the, the size of this set is. Uh, but we, what we do know is the size of diverging with average. And so here is the theorem. And actually, it, in some sense, it has a whole bunch of authors here. And now let me just try to say it. <coughs> For all Q, so the emphasis is on every Q, the Hausdorff dimension of the set diverging on average is a half, as it is in the case of the torus. Um, now, let me, the upper bound, uh, the less than or equal to a half. Um, so there's six authors here. Pisa, Paul Pisa is one of them, Archenko, Kalini, and, okay. And Pujanic, that's the announcement. Um, so I won't be talking about that, um, the proof of that at all. The lower bound, greater than equal to a half. So that was this joint work with Pisa and Masai. And I'll try to say something about how we show that. Okay? Um, so, I mean, here is sort of an inclusion. Div is con clearly contained in div on average. And there's one more set that I want to measure, mention, which is a set that I like more than either one of these. Um, and let me just explain what that set is. N E U of Q. Um, so, so what is any U of Q? What is it to me? So this stands for non-uniquely ergodic. Okay, so what does uniquely ergodic mean? So this is a notion from dynamics. You have this, in this context, you have this, say, vertical, you have this foliation of the surface by, say, vertical lines. In our picture here, Maybe these are vertical lines, okay? And to be uniquely ergodic means, well, first of all, I want all of the lines to be dense. So this is uniquely ergodic. Every vertical line is dense. Vertical line is dense on the surface. But more than that, that's just the notion of minimality. Um, it should be uniformly distributed. Uh, uniformly distributed. Every line should go everywhere on the surface in proportion to the area of the surface. Um, another way of saying that is that there's a unique up to scalar multiplication. The word unique, <coughs> this is sort of ergodic. The unique says that the sort of the transverse measure is unique up to scalar multiplication. That's where the unique comes in. This is looking at the non-uniquely ergodic. And how could you fail to be uniquely ergodic? Well, the obvious one obvious way to fail to be uniquely ergodic is you'll do, you're, you have some geodesics which close up. And then you're, you're not minimal then. Um, and that's one way. But that's a countable set, a countable set of directions where there's a closed orbit. More interesting is that there can be examples where the set of directions where the, the set of directions where the flow is um, minimal but not you know, uniformly distributed can be pretty big, can be uncountable. 
Um, so, I think I did write down, yeah, definition is, would be the same thing. This, this is the set of theta such that the vertical lines of R theta Q are not, uh, is, the vertical foliation is not uniquely ergodic. Not uniquely ergodic. <clears throat> okay, uh, this set turns out to be contained in here. This is contained in here. So, um, this has Hausdorff dimension a half. Obviously, these are smaller. And again, I don't know what a characterization, every example that's known is for any of these sets is that the Hausdorff dimension is either a half or zero. No number between zero and a half has been found. And no almost conjecture that that's the case. Um, here one hopes to have some criterion for deciding whether it's zero or a half. And I think it's going to be mostly a half except for some possible counterexamples. And here, I have no idea. <laughs> the common examples are, again, like a beach surface. There, the, it's, it's countable. And a, a cover over a beach surface branched over one point, it's countable. And there might be some others. But other than that, one possibly conjectures that it will be a house for a half. OK. OK, so that's the theorem. And now let me. Are those contaminants always proper? Uh, yes. Uh, well, <coughs> so here are the examples that are proper. Uh, again, a beach surface. This is countable. And this says uh, Hausdorff dimension a half. Uh, here, this is proper. There are examples where this is Hausdorff dimension zero, but uncountable. And this is Hausdorff dimension a half. OK? Every, every Q, the dependent are proper. No, no, no. no. Um, for example, when Q is, again, when Q is a, let's see, let me get the right sentence. When Q is a Veach surface, divergent is countable, non uniquely ergodic is countable. And they're the same set. They are the same set. Yeah, they're exactly the parabolic directions. It's like the, um, the, the, the torus is a, 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 um, a basic example of a beat surface, um, and the divergence are, are the rationals, and the non uniquely ergodic are also the rationals. There are no interesting non ergodic directions there. Yeah. So, again, these are not, they may be the same set. Okay. Okay, let me. Um, to, oh, I have a historical question. Yeah, yeah. So, so you didn't decide the for all right there. Was this previously known for like for almost all or something? Oh, um, oh yeah, let's see. Um, let me see. For almost all. Yeah, let me uh yeah, so here let me see. Here, this set was known to always have Hausdorff dimension less than or equal to half. This is a new proof of that. Okay, so this is the fact that the Hausdorff dimension here was less than or half was something I did a while ago. This is a new proof of it. Um, sorry, your question was: Was this known generically to be a half? No, no, not that, no, I don't think so. No. Let me say one other thing here. Um, recently, uh, John Chaikin and I showed that for a, again, this is maybe a little more technical than I want to be here, but for a certain stratum of uh, abelian differentials that live on hyperbolic, the hyperbolic stratum, um, this, is, this set has Hausdorff exactly a half generically. So this, and again, I sort of conjecture that Mike, uh, John Chaikin conjectures that. <laughs> Could you erase that? <laughs> yeah. We conjecture that, that 
that this should generically, for a generic Q, in the sense of measure that this should be how stark dimension should be exactly a half. And we proved it for certain strata. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me let me just try to say how do we build. I'm not going to talk about the less than or equal to a half, the upper bound. Um, that use is actually it's very it's interesting. It uses this is really uses type molar dynamics um, in a very strong way. Um, th this is sort of less, <coughs> less so and a little more geometric actually. Um, and let me just try to say how how do we build a set of Hausdorff dimension? A set of Hausdorff, big Hausdorff dimension. Okay. So again, we're we're looking for we're looking for directions where you diverge on average. So how could you possibly even come close to diverging? Well, suppose on your surface you have a I'm going to sort of try to draw a picture that's suppose on your surface you have a, lo, a very lo, so suppose beta n I'm going to do, say something sort of inductive suppose beta n is a long curve on your surface x and I'm going to make it vertical just to simplify things it's a long vertical curve determining a cylinder so you have a, a cylinder on your surface and the curve beta n is long and vertical. And now let's look at, um, a, so, so now let's look at, suppose you now flowed in that direction. So you su suppose, I mean, again, my curve is vertical here. If I flow, oops, V. So what happens when you flow when the curve is vertical? It contracts in its length, and it's going to get shorter and shorter, and in fact it will, keep on going, get short, and it will go off to the cusp, never come back to. Um, so this will diverge. The length of beta n will go to zero. Now suppose you change the angle just a little bit. So suppose we take, I'm going to write it i beta n, will be the set of angles theta, such that the angle with the vertical so this, so theta, th all angles are measured with respect to vertical. So theta is the angle with the, with the vertical. Okay, and suppose that's less than or equal to, let's say I'm gonna, and I'm gonna put in here, this should be a square, log of beta n. So this is the length of beta n, and then this is the, okay. Now, what does this side of do for you? Well, if you are in that angle, if you're close to being vertical, then your cylinder is almost vertical, but it has a, as a vector in R2, it has a very small horizontal component. Say the length is still beta n. There's a slight difference between tangents and sines, but let's say it's still beta n. This says that the tangent of the angle h over beta n is smaller than that. And now when you flow, the horizontal component expands by how much time you flow. And if the angle is small enough, well, you could, you, after flowing time beta n, e to the tn is, suppose e to the tn is equal to beta n, so the time is the length beta n, then your, your, uh, your, the length of your curve will be about equal to 1. h times beta n will still be pretty small. So now your length of your curve is 1. The horizontal component is still very small. You could flow even longer. Maybe you flow kind of this length. Okay, and maybe even divide by some epsilon. And now the vertical length will become really small, like of the order of epsilon. And if you do this correctly, the horizontal length will be, still be pretty small. So what I'm saying is that if you stay in a very small angle with the vertical, you can flow for a very long time. Then your curve will start getting short and will stay short for a fairly long period of time. And then it will start getting long because the h component, when stretched, will, will get long. 
So there will be a, if your angle is in here, there will be a kind of a definite period of time when your curve is short. Okay, now if you're trying to build a Hausdorff, if you're trying to build a, build a collection of sets where you di diverge on average, the picture, well, I want to build a Cantor set, as usual. I want to build a Cantor set of diverging on average directions. So I'm going to think of this interval, I beta n is kind of the parent in the construction <coughs> of the counter set. It's like the parent. And then, as I said, this curve beta n won't work forever because it'll eventually get long. So you have to find children who will, um, who will become short <laughs> after the parent <laughs> starts to get long. <laughs> I don't know, is that a, I'm not sure that's a metaphor. <laughs> okay, maybe if the parent is rich and then the, and the becomes poor, then the children become rich. That would be different. <laughs> but, okay. Okay, so we, what we want to do is find children. And so the construction is to find children and a picture that should look like this. So here's a blown up picture of that interval. I want to find children beta n plus 1, so there will be new curves, and I'm going to try to find a whole bunch of them. With each one of those that will have an interval, i beta n plus 1, contained in i beta n, and each one of those will have many, many children, and the divergent on average will be any point in the infinite intersection. So that's the usual construction of a Cantor set. Now, how do you find the children? And so let me draw a picture of how we're trying to find, we find children. <coughs> in some sense, it's inspired by this torus case. But when, because we're in a higher genus, we have to do um, more work. So here's this picture of beta n. And I've drawn it vertical. And now, in this quadratic differential geometry, there are singularities on each side of the cylinder. And so we could take, for example, a segment that crosses the cylinder. And then we could do day twists. So this is beta n. So we maybe call this cylinder, this segment sigma. We could do day twists about beta n um, many times and apply it to sigma. It doesn't matter whether we do horizontal or vertical. I mean, sorry, left or right. We twist many, many times and come back to another segment crossing. K here will be approximately log of beta n. So there will be many, many of these. I'm thinking of beta n as extremely long. So here's the same log. And these will be saddle connections crossing beta n. Now, if we were in the case of the torus, <coughs> well, there really isn't, there are no saddle connections, there are no singularities. Sigma would just be maybe some closed curve crossing and then twisting, just as in this AI business. But here, we don't a priori have a closed curve that we can twist around. So we, we use these things and we call them, these are maybe call them sigma n plus 1. There are a whole bunch of them, k. Okay. As k is running, okay. Now we'd like to use those as our children, but the problem is that this is some saddle connection joining distinct zeros. We know nothing about it. This might not, this sigma or the sigma n plus 1k might not determine a cylinder. So the point about the cylinder is that the cylinder allowed us to do Dane twists. And the, the child might not be. This is, we call it a, a pseudo-child. <laughs> the the pseudo-child may not determine a cylinder. So the, the first statement about the, sig the sigma n plus 1 is they make the kind of correct angle. They make the small angle. That's good. With beta n. This kind of small angle that we want in this picture. Okay. Um, and their kind of their angles between each other are kind of separated. They make a kind of a, a, a definite angle with each other. OK. 
okay, with each other. That's good. Both of those things are good when you're trying to build canter sets and trying to prove Hausdorff dimension. You want the children to be kind of separated and have a big enough interval. But the problem is they, oops, they do not determine cylinders. So what we have to do is, and this is in some sense the main step of the argument, we have to find for each sigma n plus 1k, we have to find a beta that's actually a cylinder, which is close in angle to the sigma, close in angle, and about the same length, about the same length. So there should be some about the same length. And these are going to be the children. So the main step, as I say, is not to, is not to use sigma directly, but to find a cylinder which is about the same length and about the same angle. And th those will be the children. Okay, and they will determine intervals in kind of exactly the same way. Now there will be a new interval, beta n plus 1 squared log of beta n plus 1. That will be each one of these intervals, their size. And now let me, and now what's also the point of this is one does a calculation, which I'm certainly not going to bore you with. It says that, I, I, I described how beta n gets short, and then it's going to start to get long. Beta n plus 1, the child will then take over. And just as beta n is getting to be about length 1, beta n plus 1 will take over and start getting short. And so there will be this interval of times when neither one of them is short, but most of the time, one or the other is short. So you will not know what, you, you, will, you, you cannot prove divergence by this method because there will be times when neither one of these curves is short, but it will be a kind of a bounded amount of time. Um, so that's sort of why when you, you repeat this process infinitely often, you get a canter set of divergent directions. And let me just briefly say why do you get Hausdorff dimension a half, or at least a half. And the reason is when you compute Hausdorff dimension, you, what you really care about is the length of the child divided by the length of the parent times the number of children. So let me write down that calculation. Here is the length of a child. Here is the length of a parent. Okay, and so I haven't said what these are. And then I want to multiply by the number of children. Okay, and now what, actually what I want to do is raise this to a half power. And let's see what we get. This number is like 1 over beta n plus 1 squared log of beta n plus 1. That's the numerator. The denominator is 1 over beta n squared log of beta n. The number of children is about log of beta n. And I have to raise this to a half power. OK. Now, what was beta n plus 1? Its length was about bit word, and it was, its length was about sigma n. I hope I wrote sigma n down. Uh, sigma n, I twisted log of beta n times, so I should have written this down. Sigma n k, its length, I twist about beta n this many times, so the length is about beta n log beta n. So that's about the length of sigma n. And beta n plus 1 is about the same length as that. That was step 3. OK, so let me plug that in. Hey, um, this is 1 over beta n squared. There will be a log of beta n squared. Then there's another log of roughly log of beta n. Now that you might argue this is log of beta n plus 1, but that's log of beta n time um, plus log log of beta n, which is much smaller. So it's irrelevant in this calculation. And this is 1 over beta n squared log of beta n, sorry for this long calculation. 
and then I still have to multiply by log of beta n. Ah. Okay, I have to raise this to the half power, and then multiply by that log of beta n. Okay, so what's the point of all this? There's a cube here. The beta n squares cancel. There's a cube divided by this. The numerator to this divided by this is log of beta n squared. I, um, this is in the denominator, sorry. This is 1 over log of beta n squared. I take the square root of it. I get 1 over log of beta n. I multiply by log of beta n. And this is comparable to 1. And the point is it doesn't go to 0. In other words, the number, the ratio of the lengths with the square root times the number of children is bounded away from zero. That's what this is all about. And the half here is what gives you the Hausdorff dimension. The fact that you can make a calculation with that exponent, this implies Hausdorff dimension greater than or equal to a half. So that's a basic lemma or something in, 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 the, su in the subject of Hausdorff dimension. Um, what you need, of course, is not only that's the number and the lengths, but you need to know that they're spaced. You can't have them all bunching up. And that's also part of what has to go in there. Okay, so I think, uh, well, let me stop. Other questions? Yeah, Chris. Could you say something about how you go from the saddle connection to a cylinder? Yeah. So, um, we have the saddle connection. We rotate. It's maybe yeah. We rotate, and we contract it. It's, it's you know a priori very long. We rotate and contract it so it's length one. Now we're on a surface of length one, and we oh and we have we're on some Riemann surface. Some we have some quadratic differential with a with a saddle connection of length less than or equal to one. If we're in the thick part, there's a cylinder some bounded length and we pull it back and we get this if we're in the thin part of moduli space and we have a saddle connection of length less than or equal to one we have to analyze what happens how to build cylinders in the thin part fortunately there's a whole technology now of how to do that um, and, uh, and so you sort of can apply that technology to find a cylinder. It's not necessarily disjoint from, it's not necessarily going to be disjoint from the signal, just some cylinder. And then we pull it back <coughs> to the base surface and it makes the angle that's kind of we want. Is there a yeah. is there is there a conjecture for what happens on the whole unit sphere in the tangent uh, tangent space for technology? Well, I mean, in every tight Muller disk, it's Hausdorff dimension yeah. a half. So it's so you lose a half in every exactly a half in every disk. So I think in the sphere you have to lose exactly one half. I think Hausdorff dimension works not nicely enough that way. Oh, is it the follow-up? Uh, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> yeah. I think so. Okay. Yeah, you write the you write your space as so you foliate the yeah you and you take a transversal and then foliate it and it's one half in each section and that's good enough to get one half overall. I think that, yeah. Okay, that's uh, I think how we end.